I'll read the first, the unnumbered verses, and we ask you to join together in reading the even-numbered verses. Let's stand as we read the Word of God. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. For thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Shall we pray? Lord, we come to you today for help. We come to you for that work of your spirit within our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord, to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. Guide us through the day. And Lord, may we rest in thee through the night. Lord, we thank you that you have become everything to us that we ever needed and that we ever could hope for, that you are life itself and that our life, Lord, springs from you. Now, as we study your word today, Lord, give life and light and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I have a general practice as I read the Bible. I have a little straight edge that I keep in my Bible. And I keep my pen handy because I love to underline those verses that just sort of speak to me. Uh, to just sort of highlight them so that uh, as I read through, they sort of stand out and, and just really minister to me. The problem with Colossians 1, as I look at it, I've got just about every verse underlined. It is so rich, so very rich. It's a great time for you who have not yet started to read through the whole Bible to start. It's the beginning of a new year. Start out the new year going through the Bible with us. You can start in the book of Colossians and it speaks of the preeminence of Christ and just really a great book for study. So I would encourage you to uh, study through and this afternoon begin in Colossians 1. You might also want to take a pen and a straight edge and underline the scriptures that really minister to you as you go through the word. I find it a, a great practice. It helps really my concentration in reading as I am expecting God to speak to me. I find that he does. This morning we'd like to look at Colossians chapter 1 beginning with verse 9 as Paul talks about his prayer for the church in Colossae. He had heard of their faith 
He had heard of their love that they had. And so he said, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, that is, heard of your faith in Christ and your love to the saints, we do not cease to pray for you. And this is his prayer. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That you might be fruitful in every good work and increase in your knowledge of God that you might be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. What an outstanding prayer. Paul gets right to the heart of the issues. And any time you want to do a friend a favor, open up to Colossians 1.9 and take these things that Paul prayed for the church in Colossae and pray them for your friends. Anytime you want to do me a favor, <laughs> take and open to Colossians 1.9 and pray these things for me. At the beginning of a new year, what a glorious prayer for the new year. Prayer for each other. That first of all, we might be filled with the knowledge of his will. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. There is a reason for your existence. And the most important knowledge you can ever gain is the knowledge of God's will for your life. And that should be our primary pursuit above all things, to know what is the will of God for us. The Bible tells us that we were created for his good pleasure. That's basic. You exist for the sole purpose of pleasing God. If you don't live a life that is pleasing to God, then you are bound to live in frustration and to always have that awareness and consciousness that life must be something more than what you've yet experienced because it is. You were created for his good pleasure and you will only know fulfillment when you bring God pleasure. Jesus is our example. Peter said that we should follow in his steps. And Jesus was able to say, I do always those things that please the Father. Now, he lived the perfect life. But he did always those things that pleased the Father. And how important it is for us to be able to say, I live my life to please God. God testified of Jesus at his baptism, he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All of the things that you do or have ever done for your pleasure, for your sake, they are like wood, hay, and stubble. They will be consumed in the judgment of fire. You have only one life. It will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. But you cannot accomplish the will of God for your life if you don't know what his will is. And so Paul's prayer that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, said, Don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. Do you know what God's will is for your life? 
are you seeking to accomplish his will? Paul speaks about in all wisdom and understanding, truly it is wise, it is all wisdom to seek to do the will of God for this is why I was created. Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they might be filled with the spirit of wisdom and understanding and in that case in the knowledge of God but in this case it's in the knowledge of God's will for their lives. Paul when he wrote to the Corinthians said that one day all of us will be standing before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the rewards for the things that we have done while we were in our bodies. And he said that Christ is the foundation upon which our lives should be built. But then we need to be careful as we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, we should be careful of the materials that we use in the building of our lives. He said that some people use gold and silver and precious stones. Others build with wood, hay, and stubble. And he tells us that one day all of our works are going to be judged with fire. Those that are wood, hay, and stubble, those things that I've done for myself, for my own glory or pleasure or whatever, they'll be consumed in the fire and I will suffer loss, though I will be saved. But yet there will be no reward. There'll be nothing for me. Whereas those things that are made with the gold and the silver and the precious stones, that work for Jesus Christ, that which I do according to his will, those things I'll be rewarded for. Those things will endure the test of the fire. Sort of reminds you, doesn't it, of the story of the three little pigs and how, you know, the one that built uh, with the bricks, uh, the, the one with the straw, it was blown away and so many of our works are just going to be destroyed, the wood, hay, and stubble. But we want to do those things that will be lasting, that will bring lasting results, those things that are done with eternity in view. The second thing that Paul prayed for them is that they might walk worthy of the Lord. Now that's a big order, isn't it? How could I ever walk worthy of the Lord? Surely not in my own strength or in my own ability. It is only as I walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit that I could possibly walk worthy of the Lord. You see, God has adopted you as his child. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. He's adopted you as his child. And being a child of God, there is a certain protocol by which I should walk worthy of the Lord. You know, if you were born into the royal family in England, there is certain protocol for the royal family. There are certain things that you don't do because you are royalty. And then there are certain things that you do do because you are royalty. But you don't want to disgrace the royal family. And so there's a certain protocol. You have to walk worthy of your station in life as a part of the royal family. Well, let me tell you this. You belong to the royal family of God. And as a child of God, there is a certain protocol. There are certain things that we're not to do, we're not to be engaged in. And because I am a child of God, there are certain things I should be doing as I walk worthy of the Lord. 
Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, said, you're not to walk as the world walks, as people in the world or the pagans walk. Because they just go on in the emptiness of their minds. Their understanding is darkened. They are alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance. And they are past feeling, and thus they've given themselves over to living lascivious lives. Their works are impure, and they are motivated by greed. Now those are the negative, that's not allowed, that's not to be for the child of God. That isn't walking worthy of what you are. Paul's next petition is that they might be filled, or they might be fruitful, rather, in every good work. Our good works come from our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have a right relationship with Jesus, there's going to be certain fruit that is just going to naturally come forth from your life. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that bringeth forth fruit. As you abide in Jesus Christ, as his life flows into yours, just like as the life of the vine flows into the branch, as it flows into the branch, it brings forth fruit. As the life of Christ flows into you, it will bring forth fruit in your life. And so Paul's prayer is that you might be fruitful in every good work. Jesus said that the Father was glorified when we bring forth much fruit. Fruitful in every good work. As you look at your life today and make a examination, is your life producing good fruit for the kingdom of God? Jesus said, by their fruit ye shall know them. And in context with that statement, by their fruit ye shall know them. Not by what they say not by their professions, but by their fruit. What is coming forth? What fruit is coming forth from their lives? Jesus said, every good tree that brings forth, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Again, let a man examine himself. What kind of fruit is coming forth from my life? Paul tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love. Then Paul prayed for them that they might increase in their knowledge of God. How would you rate your knowledge of God today? How, how well do you know God? We have dedicated our life to bringing to men the knowledge and understanding of God as he has revealed himself through his word. And that's why we go through the whole Bible. Because, you see, the Bible is God's revelation of himself to man. You cannot know God in truth apart from the Bible. This is God's revelation of himself. And Paul is praying that they might be filled or increased in the knowledge of God. He speaks in verse 6 of knowing the grace of God in truth. Now, in his prayer that you might increase in your knowledge of God, just how is this accomplished? The friend of Job named Zophar said to him, Can you by searching find out God? 
Can you find out the Almighty unto perfection? Many men who profess to know God really don't have the slightest clue about God. There are those that have sort of created their own gods, their own concepts of God. And, and their concepts of God are based on the premise that if I were God, this is what I would do. If I were God, this is how I would live. And so you find in Greek mythology the various concepts of God expressed in the stories of their gods. How they would react, how they would respond if they were God. And so man has created his own gods, but they are a projection of himself. From what sources have you gained your knowledge of God? Is it on what others have told you about God? Or have you diligently read God's revelation of himself? As you read the Bible, do you read it for the purpose of understanding and knowing God better? And then, do you know God by personal relationship? Now, Paul, when he said that you might be increased in the knowledge of God, he's using a, a word from the Greek, the base word is gnosko, and that's to know by experience. Have you really experienced God in your life? Do you, does your knowledge stem from your experience with him? When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said that I might know him. And that he's using the same gnosko, know him by experience. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know God. He's praying for those in Colossae that they might know God. They might be increased in their knowledge of God. And then he prayed for them that they might be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. If ever there was a time in history when we need to experience and to know the power of God in our lives, it's today. The powers of darkness are working overtime to destroy mankind. There's a group today that are trying to get something going because they say that if when a person sneezes, you say, God bless you, you're actually violating their constitutional rights of freedom from religion. That if you invite someone over to your house for dinner and you pray for the meal that actually you're violating their constitutional rights. How ridiculous can you get? You know, even a child reading the Constitution would realize and understand that it was freedom of religion that was being spelled out in the Constitution, that every man can worship God after the dictates of his own heart. But it wasn't trying to say there should be freedom from religion, which, of course, it has been interpreted by our Supreme Court. What a tragedy that even a child's understanding is superior to that of those brilliant men who sit on the Supreme Court. Isn't it interesting when you talk about freedom of speech, they have interpreted that to mean that you can say every filthy, foul, vile thing that you wish at any place you desire. Uh, some artist 
painting a blasphemous picture of Christ is supported by the National Endowment for Arts, which is your tax money. He is supported by that, and he paints a picture of Jesus in a bottle of urine and calls that freedom of speech and is protected under freedom of speech. And yet, if you dare say that homosexuality is a sin, then you are actually guilty of a hate crime and instigating hate towards a certain group of people. And they are seeking to develop legislation that will stop any kind of negative declarations concerning a person who wants to live a homosexual lifestyle. In fact, there's a fireman up in Minnesota who has been fired from his job uh, because he said that homosexuality was a sin. He was ordered by the court to go through, uh, you know, classes that will help him to understand and accept. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Freedom of speech. For whom? For those who want to use filthy language, they, they press freedom of speech. But to stand up and say, you know, unless you repent, you're going to perish in your sins and go to hell? Oh, my. You know, they'll do their best to silence you in a hurry. We need power. Power to stand in these days. That you might be strengthened, Paul said, with all might. That would be his might because he's almighty God according to his glorious power. You know, we've all heard the story of the, the frog and the boiling water illustration. Put a frog in boiling water and he'll jump out immediately. But if you put him in cool water and turn the fire under it where it's getting gradually warmer, 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 that he'll stay in it until he's cooked. Uh, and it, it, evil, you know, it, it's, it's a growing thing. And we have become sort of inoculated in a sense a little bit and we develop a tolerance towards it then a little more we develop a tolerance until now it seems like we have a tolerance for almost anything goes and we're supposed to have this tolerance but it sort of crept up on us we need the power of God in these days that we might stand as Paul wrote to the Ephesians having done all stand and we need the help of God to do it. Be strong in the Lord, Paul said, and in the power of his might that you might stand against the wiles of the devil. But how wonderful it is that God has made this power available to us. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses of me. And so Paul prays for them that they might be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And then when that is so, there should be three characteristics that mark our lives. We should be patient, long-suffering, and filled with joy. Those should be the marks of the Christian. That I become very patient, that I become long-suffering, and that I am filled with joy. So for the new year, what a wonderful prayer. As we start out this year, may we be filled with the knowledge of God's will 
in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. May we walk worthy of the Lord in all wisdom and all pleasing. And may we be fruitful, bear fruit for the Lord in every good work as we increase in our knowledge of God. May we be strengthened with his might according to his glorious power. And may we have all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness in this year to come. Father, we thank you for your help, your power. And Lord, you know our hearts. We desire to do your will. So fill us, Lord, with the knowledge and an understanding of your will and plan for our lives. And help us, Lord, that we might be fruitful as we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? As I say, whenever you want to bless me, just turn to these verses and pray these things for me. And I'll tell you what, I'll do the same. This is my prayer for you for this new year, that these things might become a reality in your life, a greater knowledge and understanding of God greater knowledge and understanding of his purpose and plan for your life. That your life will become fruitful for him. That you might experience God's power and God's grace in a greater measure than you've ever known before. May this be our best year yet as we follow after Jesus Christ. The Lord bless thee. The Lord and keep thee. The Lord make 